We have not made a video for the Demystify Sci Investigates channel for about six months. The format of the videos that we were making previously is just way too labor intensive when you couple it to all of the stuff we're doing on the podcast and all of the stuff that we are doing on the Material Atomics channel. So we're going to explore some ideas that we've been talking about with people, but we haven't had a chance to present in a formal setting, and we want to hear what you guys think. And so today what I really want to talk about is I want to talk about how there is no such thing as life. There's no such thing as life? When we think about life, we tend to think about it as an object. Like, people will study the origin of life, and the thing that they're studying in the origin of life is they're like, how did the first cell come about? You can basically translate from origin of life to origin of cells and not really lose any information content in that switch. When we talk about something like consciousness, we're like, how is a thing like life able to take a step outside of itself and look at the fact that it's having an experience and then be able to build all of these structures on top of that? And so you have a lot of people that are wandering around in the world and they're like, well, how did life come to be? How does life have consciousness? And they can't figure it out. And I think that the reason that they can't figure it out is because they're making the mistake that they're treating life as a thing rather than an idea. Yeah, this is really perplexing because I'm running up against the same wall in the physics world where an atom is essentially a body. It's an object, as you say, that has a particular surface and architecture. But at the same time, it's a dynamic process that's constantly in motion. And in order to understand the atom, it's impossible to treat it as this static object. You have to be able to, on one hand, hold it in your mind as a static object, but at the same time, realize that it's a process which is continually unfolding. And the same thing plays out with your own being, because, of course, I have a body, and you can take a picture of it and make a model of me, but you don't capture the meanness. And furthermore, all of my individual subunits will be totally different 10 years from now than they are today, but I'll still be here, which is absolutely perplexing. The thing that's incredible about life is that life has an experience. It's technically just atoms that are organized in some kind of persistent shape, but it has a lived experience. And we pretty much agree that, okay, the rock doesn't have a lived experience, and yet the person does. But at the end of the day, they're both just crystalline structures of atoms. And so so much confusion is out in the world because people are like, well, how does a thing that's basically not really any different from a rock have this thing that's really different from the thing that we that we expect the rock to have? And that all comes down to the fact that people look at life as an object rather than this thermodynamically favorable emergence of order. But I would say that the birth point of life is not where the cell emerges. I think that it's in the spontaneous reactions that each of us carry around at the heart of all of our cells. And they keep happening too. That's what's really fascinating to me about life is that it's a process that is stable in some sense, that your body will essentially look the same. Of course, it's going to change with aging and so forth, but the form stays the same. If you take a bacteria even, it might divide, it might add more material to itself, but it maintains that form over time. The process has a static form to it, which gives it the impression of being an object, of being a body in a physical sense but it's an unfolding process. It's a being. It's, it's this state of being where it's constantly reassembling itself at all times. And that's a difficult gray area to negotiate because it really seems to me like life forms are both objects and processes simultaneously. And I honestly could say the same thing about an atom if I'm going to be really scrutinizing about it. But that doesn't mean that it's only an idea, right? It's still comprised of material objects. If I was going to write an introductory textbook, I would be like, okay, so we have five states of matter, liquid, solid, gas, plasma, life. Mm. Physics deals with the first four, and biology deals with the fifth. And that's why we have biology and physics and not just physics, because there's something about the state of matter when it becomes sufficiently organized that it can run under its own weight is when you get life. So... What is life? I think it's spirit. It is a state of matter that is so organized that it can go out and do stuff. It's goal-oriented. 
it's goal oriented. It has wants. It has preferences. It has a desire for how to make the world in its own vision. Let's say you have some sterile field and a bacteria gets dropped in it. What is it going to do? It's going to start remaking that field in its own vision. And that's going to be bacterial vision and we're probably not going to like it. But we're not doing anything different fundamentally than the bacteria because all that we do is progressively collect more and more complex goals that we require our body plan, our neural circuitry, our, our neurotransmitters to be able to achieve. But really, it's this goal-oriented process that allows us to take what is and to turn it into what we want it to be. And I think that that is the study of biology. It's the study of how do you get chemistry that's able to do stuff. Yeah, I, I came across, I rediscovered this gentleman, Rod Swenson, recently, who put this into mathematical terms. And the way that he describes the uniqueness of life, its desire to remake its surroundings, he called the law of maximum entropy production. And he mathematically formalized the idea that, hey, look, life on the outset, you look at it and you think, well, this, this is a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. It's not maximizing entropy, which is what we would expect for some closed system. And he didn't even get into arguing about whether it was a closed or open system, but he said, look, if you go and look at any life form, it's tearing up the environment. It's taking things and metabolizing them. It's crushing up the world around it. I mean, take a two-year-old and put them in a room full of expensive musical equipment for an afternoon, right? Or, or take uh, you know, a rat and put it in a, a cage with a bunch of fresh bedding supplies. It'll just rip it to shreds. It's going to eat everything in sight. This is what life does, is it maximizes thermodynamically favorable process of maximizing entropy production external to its own form. And by doing that, it's actually running down an energy gradient because it is the easiest thing to do in terms of thermodynamics. It's really helpful for people to think about life as a continuum. It is not the cell. It is something that starts before the cell. And it has to do with the organization of matter. And it sounds so woo, but this resonant ability to just keep pushing forward into the future and to keep the keep the magic trick going and it's not a guarantee that the magic trick can go on for long enough to make a human or a dolphin or a tree but on some planets it does and if we can think of it as being a continuum rather than a discrete event that's probably still happening right now I think that we'll be able to solve a lot of these questions around consciousness and like, how is it that we experience? Well, we experience because we're not a thing. We're, we're an event. Yeah, and if we take Rod Swenson's thermodynamic reasoning, it's not a woo process at all. It's absolutely thermodynamically necessary that life occurs. It's the absolute eventuality of putting the right chemicals in the right environment at some point in time. It has to happen because it is the easiest thing to happen which is perplexing, but you have to factor in the system at the same time. And I've said it a million times in the podcast, but I have to say it again. You can't exist without the trees outside of your window. It really forces you to rethink how separate you really are from those trees if you can't live without them. That's absolutely true. And you also said something really interesting, which really underlines the fact that we probably already think about life as an event without realizing it, because you said how life happens. Bodies don't happen. Events happen. Mm. We are beings more than we are bodies. All right, let's go be. Bee.